Kia ora, kia ora ana. namaste, uh, malo alele, talo falawa, uh, ni hao, and a uh, very warm welcome to you all if you're joining us right here this morning as we come into this, the third episode of the Moments That Matter series brought to you by the Waitakere Ethnic Board. Uh, my humblest apologies uh, for this morning, I had a couple of technical issues behind the scenes, uh, which we've managed to resolve, which is always a fantastic thing, and uh, we are coming to you uh, live at this present point in time, both here on the Zoom webinar and also streaming out to Facebook on Greg Ward speaker, and also on the Waitakere Ethnic Board website, uh, sorry, Facebook um, group. So please feel free to head across to those uh, locations as well if you'd like to be part of this. Also, we would love your feedback. We do have an opportunity for some Q&A. Uh, we do have an opportunity for some chat as well. So if you are on the webinar itself, feel free to throw some e uh, details and information in those spaces. Uh, so we have a fantastic show lined up for you here today over the course of the next uh, roughly 70 minutes or so and uh, coming up very shortly indeed is uh, Dani Rios and she's joining us uh, here she's based in Christchurch but she is originally from Argentina and uh, she'll be telling us a little bit about her journey and of course uh, she is a fabulous practitioner in terms of mindful empathy in fact that is the title of her uh, uh, book which has been recently published so looking forward to having a chat with her in the very uh, near future in just a few short moments but firstly uh, I thought I would uh, just Bearing in mind that this is all about COVID, this is about our COVID response and looking after our communities, migrant and ethnic communities from Waitakere all the way through to Northland and beyond, I thought it was probably only fair that we should do a little bit of news. So coming up, of course, uh, uh, we have the uh, wonderful Danny Rios, who's joining us here in just a few short moments. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we've noticed over the course of the last few days, and in particular, uh, the, the great information that has passed to us through, uh, through to us by government, is that we have an element of mandatory mask wearing coming up. Uh, coronavirus has been covering our entire days uh, for the last eight months or so, and it's not going to stop in the near future. And it's really up to all of us to ensure that we're doing uh, our bit. Uh, as a consequence of that, from 11.59 tonight, which is Wednesday, the 18th of November, uh, we will be going to mandatory mask wearing on all public transport, including uh, buses, trains, uh, airplanes. Uh, however, uh, it is still, you don't necessarily need to wear a mask throughout the day. However, we absolutely uh, would recommend this and uh, we cannot be complacent with this particular pandemic. Uh, we're doing incredibly well down here in New Zealand, but certainly don't want to get complacent and find ourselves back in the uh, lockdown situations. It really is up to all of us. And uh, if everybody does their bit, we will be absolutely fantastic so just do please do keep that in mind as we uh, rock on through to the next of our series and our speaker who is joining us in a short moment in fact such a short moment that i'm going to have her join me right now so a very warm welcome to danny rios how are you doing danny nice to have you here yeah nice to be here buenos dias muy buenos dias a todos <laughs> and i can say it in different languages as well <laughs> As, as you'll heal very shortly, I've been around, uh, coming from a diplomatic family, so I've been in different countries, learned different languages and cultures. Which, what's so, really lovely, of course, is uh, we're actually all throughout this COVID time, we've had opportunities to be able to actually connect with so many different people. And this series in its own right has been a wonderful opportunity to do that. Uh, in fact, for all of our viewers mm -hmm. out there, um, uh, Danny and I, only recently met and uh, we've had uh, a connection over LinkedIn and got an opportunity to start chatting and we found that we clicked particularly well, um, particularly around this element of, of wellness and, and uh, resilience, uh, empathy, uh, mindfulness and the like. Um, and Danny is a very strong practitioner of this, uh, has a uh, master's degree in occupational uh, psychology as well, uh, which of course is brilliant because it gives us an actual technical scientific background to the work that she does and that's one of the biggest things in this area i think uh would you agree with that danny that we you know it's, there's a lot of people out there who give a lot of advice um some of it may not necessarily be scientifically founded that is true that is true 
Yeah, I, I always have looked at science to explain lots of things that I couldn't really understand when I was growing up and moving into different countries. And I had, I'll be talking more about in, in detail, but um, you know, the sensation of being isolated, being alone, not knowing the culture I was in. And he, there's so much information, but what can you really trust? So I was always looking into scientific explanation of things to have some kind of congruence because otherwise it depended on the beliefs of the different people I met, the different schools, different cultures. So in the end, it was... It was confusing. So I, I do I do always like to have some research background to understand things and it's helped me and then practice, but I'm going to be talking about the practice later, <laughs> which I think is the most exciting part. <laughs> absolutely fantastic. And I think that, that's really key, right? Because we can, we can have, we have a lot of thoughts. All of us have thoughts all the mm -hmm. time. Um, five times more negative than positive, uh, which is really challenging, but that's part, of, <laughs> part and parcel of, uh, of us as animals, ultimately, right? That's the old hindbrain sitting there and going, okay, where's the danger? Where's the danger? We've got to keep on looking for the danger and, and uh, keeping safe. And of course, we haven't evolved that much. We've got pretty civilized uh, on the whole part, but we haven't evolved that much. So those challenges are with us all the time. And that's all well and good from a thought perspective, but actually acting upon strategies that are beneficial is another thing entirely. And that's a, a, an area that we all really need to focus on and practice more. This whole and series, especially in these times of COVID, right? I was just going to say, I mean, the whole, the, re, the whole reason that we are doing this and I have to say a, a, a huge thank you to Foundation North uh, for their support in putting this together and the Otoro Academy as well. Uh, it's it's a, a very good response, I think, for all of our communities. And uh, as I've said before, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And in fact, right at the beginning of the webinar series, I posed a question to say, what have been some of the challenging things uh, to deal with here in this uh, in these COVID times? And the responses, uh, you know, were pretty uniform, you know, in terms of how do we look after family? How do I maintain the financials, uh, you know, in, in the sort of these strained circumstances? Um, but I just want to come back to you, Danny, and just, and you know, you're here with us, you're our, our guest and our guest speaker. Now, Danny's going to present um, over the course of this uh, session as well. We've got some slides we'll be showing. Um, but um, I'm, I'm fascinated, uh, with, you know, I'm an immigrant too, so I've come to this country and it's such a beautiful wonderful place uh, and we're going to hear some of that story from you um what but firstly what was your first impression of new zealand the first time you set foot on the shore well the first time it was just amazing it was so beautiful uh, but i must say i was prompted before uh, I it, it wasn't the very first time i migrated so i knew that in order to be able to adapt better to the place, you need to know about it. And I had spoken with somebody who said, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. Um, the, the beaches and the mountains and, and everything, you have everything there. And, and people are so friendly. So I was already prompted to feel that way. So that, that was really great. And I did feel that way, it's really beautiful. And, and people are very welcoming. I've lived in different countries and I know that some places struggle more with migrators mm. and New Zealand is very much open to people from different ethnicities, different backgrounds. And I know there's been a little bit of talk of, of discrimination through what happened with the mosque attack, but in general, it is so much more open to other ethnicities and hopefully, what, what I speak about today and what others are speaking, because I've also listened to other speakers and it's really wonderful. It creates that awareness of the other who's not really very different to you and everybody else. So we're human beings and we have the same needs, the same difficulties, the same challenges and the same wants. We, we just all want to be happy and feel comfortable in who we are. So we're not really that different. If we can I, look for that. <laughs> I do agree with you that there is the challenges that we have in terms of cross-culturalization, this element of we tend to move to, uh, especially when we migrate to a different country, we tend to find those people who are most like ourselves because that's the comfort factor. I mean, that's where we want to be. 
uh, and those communities grow and, and the, the challenges is to, on the borders of those communities. How do we cross those borders? How do we have an element of assimilation between cultures where we don't lose inherently who we are and, and, our, and our aspects of culture, but that we're unafraid of being able to actually have those conversations and begin to understand how somebody else works through in this world. Um, and some of those are, are, are challenging and everybody's different and everybody has a different sort of uh, thought process around that. Um, so I'll be keen to hear your, your thoughts in, uh, in how best and potentially can we strengthen our communities, particularly in these times, uh, mm. by having the element of, of crossover or you know, being able to reach out and, and, uh, and take, what, take what's best from each of our cultures and share it. Mm. Yes, so that's a, a valuable thing. Yeah, and, and, and language really says a lot. So uh, we, we need to first understand, you know, what are we really doing as migrants? Are we, are we really assimilating to the other? See, you said assimilation, and that's one of the theories. See, I'm bringing a little bit of science so you get that context. So there are different processes that we have. We can either separate and uh, be marginalized, we can assimilate or we can integrate. And what we really want to do is integrate with the, with the culture. And what that really means then is that you are adding a culture. You're not subtracting from yours. You're keeping your culture, you're keeping your values, your family values, your, your ethic, right? You're keeping that but you're adding on the new ethnicities that are around you. So it's not only the mainstream, it will be others as well because there, is, there are lots of ethnicities around us. So what we want is to integrate. Assimilate has another connotation and that's, mm. that's telling you that you are going to become like them. And that is actually the fear that we have. Uh, when you don't know. So that's why I really love science, that it really explains it. They, they do really deep research in this. And so when you know that you're actually not losing by being friendly with people who are from a different culture, then that's when you can start to let go of that fear and embrace them and also embrace your culture at the same time, but not separate or marginalize because some people by separating themselves also marginalize themselves. Um, but then I'll, I can talk more about that. That's, that's the relationship between the host, but also the guest. So the host members, people who have been here for longer and the guests or newcomers. So it has to be something that works together. And that's what I love about New Zealand that we are working together the, the mainstream culture and, and, and government and, and people are very friendly and they work together so that people do feel integrated as well. And you can walk on the street and, and not feel that they're observing you. And I remember when I lived in Germany, I would feel very observed and sometimes not myself because I would think, oh, maybe she's French, maybe she's Spanish, European. But then they would see other cultures and, and, and I didn't like that because I saw that there was this um, discontent and this um, like undermining other cultures. So, so here, this is really a great place to integrate. And, and I think we need to keep up the good work because mm. it is very easy to fall back to, to what we are naturally, which is, uh, this is me, this is my culture. I know it, so it's good and it's better. And the moment you're talking about being better and you're not really saying it, you're not conscious, but it's something that's in the unconscious mind. And you think, oh, I'm better. And, and then you're not really giving the other culture an opportunity. That's so true. Uh, it, it's, it's a challenge all the way around. And I like the way that you describe the element of assimilation. Because assimilation has so many connotations as well. It's probably a word I've used uh, uh, that, that doesn't really describe the experience. But the elements of integration, the ability to take what is best from these multiple cultures uh, and share them is, is, a, is a very powerful tool. Uh, and I just so hope that we can as a nation, and I think we do this 
pretty well in the world, on a world stage, is that we continue on the path of understanding uh, of other cultures and uh, mm -hmm. allow ourselves to become even more cosmopolitan, to, to have this, this homogenous um, society where we are living the best of everybody, everybody else's um, uh, experiences. I think that's a, a, a good way of doing it without taking someone's culture, without um, uh, making it part of yours, uh, uh, without the respect that, that each of those cultures is due. So I thought at this point, um, what might be a, a good thing for us to do is to uh, pass over to you, Danny, and um, we'll kick into this element of presentation. And uh, uh, we're going to get around about three quarter way through for our audience. And at that point, we'll, we'll pause and we'll do another bit of a chat. Feel free to post um, any Q&A that you like there in the chat or, or in the uh, Q&A on the, on the webinar. And if you are joining us, uh, on the Facebook side of things. Um, I will be reviewing some of those comments as well there. And uh, we'll be hopefully be able to uh, have a two way level of communication because really that's what we want to do here in this space. Um, so Danny, I shall leave this to you. I'll, I'll uh, put up your presentation and uh, we'll get underway. Looking forward to this very, very much indeed. Thank you, Greg. That's very kind. Okay, so I'll First of all, I would like to say what I'm going to be doing so you can uh, know what to expect. So first of all, I'll be talking a little bit about my personal story, and then I will give a little, a few tips that will have to do with uh, the immigration and, um, well, you'll see, so some tips, and then we'll have a pause, and then I'll talk a little bit more about research that I've done that ended up in me writing a book together with Dr. Wayne Duncan. So is the slide show back up? Yeah, so this is my life uh, in a nutshell in terms of traveling. I hope you can see all those pins. The pins represent a country or a city I've lived in. In Europe, it's uh, quite intense there. I've, I was born in Europe, I was born in Denmark, and I lived in, in different countries from Russia. And I will actually show you, I'll guide you through a little bit of, uh, with, with some pictures so we can travel a bit, why not? So from Moscow, so I was born in Denmark, then after five days, I was almost born on a plane, but in the end, I, my mother had to stay for two and a half months in the hospital. And then we flew to Moscow and from Moscow to New York, only a couple of months later. And I also was in Buenos Aires, in Munich. I mean, there are different places. I'm not gonna show them all, otherwise it would be the whole presentation, but just to have a little bit of uh, a view of the different places I lived in. And then I was also in Canada. Uh, I'm also Canadian, by the way. I became Canadian because I immigrated to Canada first without my family. So I'm not, not taken there through uh, with, with a diplomatic lifestyle and then England where my son was actually born. And then we came here and this has been home for 11 years. And this, this is what my life was in the highlights, in the high moments, right? We hosted wonderful people. We met lots of people and some of them were famous. Uh, some of you, especially if there's any Argentine in here or even Latin American, you'll know Astor Piazzolla. I think some of you, even Kiwis, will know Astor Piazzolla and from other places. He, he's a very famous, or he was, he passed away. He's a very famous jazz composer and jazz player. And he was amazing. I got to see him in the front row and it was amazing to see his fingers on that, um, accordion type, bandoneon. And then Jorge Luis Borges, also very famous. And we met so many wonderful people, artists, painters, really wonderful. But that was not the everyday life. So it was not all fun and games, as some people might imagine diplomatic lifestyle is. Not really. You travel, that's the wonderful part. But the reality, unfortunately, is the more day-to-day -day is you're, you feel socially isolated many times. Each time you move, 
and you can probably relate to when you moved, at first you feel socially isolated. You don't know, know people. You don't know where to go. You don't know where the best schools are, the best restaurants are, or the, the basic or the best supermarkets. So you do feel socially isolated. And you also feel the separation from your friends. And although I actually moved I either moved or I changed schools or there was something always going on. So every single year throughout my primary school and secondary school were all about moving or changing or going into a new class, growing into a new division every single year. So I had to experience this unfortunately every single year. So I do know what it's like to be a, a migrant and well, I am one here as well but I've been here for 11 years. And so what we need to do is, is to be prepared for change. You know, as I said before, before even coming to New Zealand, I knew I was coming. Now, sometimes you don't know much in advance, right? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but usually you don't really know unless you've been planning this for a long time. Uh, we only had like one month or two months notice. And then it was like, okay, going to Germany, got to learn German. <laughs> and, and for here, I didn't find out with much notice either. My husband got a job, I had a small baby, and we had less than three months time to get everything organized and sorted. But well, he had applied. So I was starting to find out a little about New Zealand. And in England, I found this I, I spoke with this man who was just in love with New Zealand and wanted to come back. So I thought, hey, this is a pretty cool place to come. <laughs> and uh, so it is. So when it, so, so what does this mean? Uh, Young, Young Kim, this is an author and uh, she has written lots of research on immigration and intercultural or cross-cultural or some call it intercultural communication. So she's someone you'll want to look up if you're interested in knowing more. And she talks about adaptation processes. And she also talks about that integration, assimilation, all, all that. And she, is there a question there? No? Okay. So your potential to adapt is really related to how prepared you are to change and change is really a constant, right? And because like right now through COVID-19, we're experiencing some important changes. We're experiencing, or many of us, many people are experiencing loss of jobs, uh, having to work from, from a computer. Myself, I used to do trainings in person or coach in person, now it's more online, now I'm doing it more internationally, it's changed, right? And, and to be able to adapt to change, you need to be prepared. So that's what I love really, uh, you know, doing, and I'll be talking about some tips to, well, how do you prepare? How do you get ready, right? So first of all, we need to understand why it is so difficult to change what are all these anxieties about? And it's really about the unknown. We just don't know how it's going to end up. But you know what? Life goes on. We will get through this. And I think that's a message of hope that we always need to keep in mind because no matter how anxious you are, it will, it will end up okay. So having this knowledge, even having the knowledge and instead of, you know, building it up, because you feel anxious when you have a new and uncertain circumstance, and especially when it's, it feels really threatening, like a job loss, and then, oh, how am I going to be able to, you know, feed my family or, you know, live, even for yourself? So even having the knowledge that, okay, this is temporary, this, you know, this too shall pass, <laughs> it will. And the reason why we get anxious is because we're, we just don't know about the future, but we do get through it. So that's important to bear in mind. And another thing, and this comes, this comes from the social identity theory, another really interesting 
theory and, and scientific background to understand more is what happens when we go into another culture? Very often we're thinking we, and, and I mean, we don't do it consciously, okay? This happens unconsciously. It's I or my family, my culture of origin, right? It's, it's us and the others are them, right? It's the other, it's them. And by doing that in our heart, what we're doing, you see, is we're separating instead of trying to connect, to encompass, involve, integrate, right? It's natural, it's only natural. And that's why it's good to know these things so that we know that this is the natural thing but we can do something to change it, okay? So what we want is to integrate. I've been saying this before, right? Now we need both cultures to collaborate. We need the host culture and ourselves as the newbies, right? In a way, newbies, even if we've been here for 20 years, we're still somehow new, at least because others will have maybe generations here. Right, so they, they may have like three, four generations or, or even more, right? So we need to, on one hand, the host culture needs to welcome the minority and the minority needs to somehow be ready to accept the welcome. And, and I've observed that very often, right? It's that not accepting, but so because it takes two to tango, and here's a good one for Argentinians, right? The tango. <laughs> it does take two to tango. And so we need both to work together, to integrate, right? And you're adding, again, you're adding to your culture. You're not subtracting. And this is so important. This is so, so important. I remember when I was in Germany, it took me ages where I felt it took me ages. I was young, so it couldn't take me too long, right? But I really felt that I couldn't, I couldn't integrate. I couldn't be part of them. I couldn't belong because I was different. And boy, was I different. I was different in all senses because I wasn't even from one, one culture only. But in any case, I was, I felt very different until there was this moment, this like click where I realized, okay, this is not doing me any good. I'm actually suffering because I'm not connecting with them because I'm not, I mean, they don't seem as friendly, but am I really doing everything I can to integrate? So there it was like a click and I said, okay, no, it's not me and them. It's not my thing is better than their thing. It's not my culture is better than their culture or my mixed hybrid, <laughs> hybrid culture is better than theirs. And it was that moment that I just did that click and I started enjoying and I started feeling I belonged. So I, I hope this is like, um, it gives you a little hope if you're still in that place uh, especially for those who have migrated or immigrated more recently. But I think this happens for a longer time because it's something that is in our beliefs, right? And if it comes from family, down from family, you still might be saying, and, and I know this is very common, you know, you keep looking at your country from the far and imagining, oh yeah, how wonderful, how wonder it would be, wonderful it would be to be back with family and friends and, you know, and and then you start seeing whenever something doesn't go well, then you think, oh, it would be better there. But that's not true. <laughs> that's just not true. So you need to demystify that. Okay. And then when you can do that and say, yep, okay, this is where I am. This is my reality. There are good things that happen and bad things that happen. That's, that's just life. And then you get on with it and allow yourself to integrate. I like this image. I put this image in because having different cultures, the different, and, and when I say different, I'm not talking about only your culture and the mainstream culture. I'm talking about all the diversity that we have, right? If you mix the different cultures, then it's like, it can be really exciting. 
you can find you you get anxious, but it's also anxiety. You know, you have also that anxiety of of ooh, what's going to happen? Ooh, I wonder what I can learn from this. Ooh, what's going to result from this? And innovation happens that way when we have different people adding like chemical components, and then you 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 just mix them, and and something explosive can come out of that, you know, something really, really cool can come out of that. So I thought this was just a wonderful slide to, to, to represent that and how we can integrate by each one, giving that little bit that we're adding on to the culture, not subtracting, adding on. So, to belong, what, what, what do you need? So it does require having good friends. It requires having some shared experiences and shared values. And the shared experiences, look, the good news is you can have shared experiences. You just need to look for someone from a culture that you're not so, or an ethnicity that you're not so familiar with. Okay, well, let's start making a shared experience so they become more familiar. And when they become more familiar, then you can integrate it into yourself, right? So one thing is shared experiences and you can manage that, right? And can you get good friends that are local or from a different ethnicity? Of course you can. You just need to reach out to them, right? And when you make friends, what do you do? You usually share values. So maybe at first you've got you know, you think you have different values, but the moment that you start relating more and, and doing more things together and building a new community in a way, right? Then that's where you start sharing values as well and see, oh, okay, they weren't that different after all, right? <laughs> you start becoming more like them. So belonging means, and the way to belong is by not focusing on differences. Remember when I was saying my example in Germany where I was like, oh, that's them. And I was kind of distancing myself. Well, yeah, that's because I was focusing on differences and I did that for far too long. But because of that, I had a tremendous identity crisis for so many years, which I could only overcome very recently. Well, not recently, but you know, in my 30s, I could really start releasing all that tension that I had built up from focusing on differences. Oh, I'm different. I'm different. No, no, no. Let's focus on something else. Let's focus on similarities. What do we like to do? What do we share? And here's here's are some pictures from me sharing with people from, from here, from New Zealand, who are locals, who have been here for a long time, and they, they come from Kiwi families. And so the love for leadership. Uh, at the top, you've got David Templeman. He's been a leader. He runs his own business now. And, and at the bottom, we have my, my mates from my Toastmasters group, where we learn more leadership and communication skills. And I'm, I'm a speaker thanks to having gone through the process and, and their help really. And uh, yeah, so I used to host this program, A Toast to You on Plains FM. And uh, I, I actually spoke last month, but uh, they are now the hosts and I'm very proud of them. And another thing you can do to support yourself and which I have used as a and, and th this is one tip that I find is uh, find support. And I think this is not really the tip. The tip is something else because, but this is very useful to help us to, to build roots in a country, to, to build roots in a place you live in, to build community is by su finding support, but also giving support to your own community. But here's the other thing. It's also finding and giving so giving and receiving support from new communities. In this case, I've got the radio community or the Toastmasters uh, community. I thought um, they're showing their backs, but that's because I didn't ask them for permission for a picture. I'm sure they'll be fine, but that's my meditation group. 
And at the bottom there, um, I'm training other club leaders. I was a club leader last year, so I was training other club leaders. So that was my supporting. And the same with the radio, I supported, I mentored the, the two new hosts, Rob and Dennis, through mentoring them to be able to become excellent. And actually they're, they've, they've far outgrown me, which I love. <laughs> I think they're doing such a great job. But it's about giving and, and receiving, right? So we talked about, I, I heard resilience, I think every single time. So we had two other speakers, right? And they were also talking about resilience. And I believe that this is something that we'll be hearing also in the other series and with the other speakers. And one thing about resilience, I mean, I could talk so much because I actually did research in this when I did my organizational um, organizational psychology or applied psychology degree. And, but one thing that I would like to, to really stress is that to be able to adapt. So it's not really about resilience as in, okay, now um, this, is, this is our level, whatever it is, whatever it means to you, this is how you live, this is the normal, right? And then all of a sudden there's a, a spike down for some reason, right? It can be, you know, the loss of a job, as we were saying, or any of the consequences of COVID-19, of the earthquakes here in Christchurch, etc. So you have this peak downwards. And then resilience is not really about just coming back up to where you were. It's really about learning from the experience because through challenges, we learn. We learn a lot through challenges. So when you come back down to that tip, you you grow back you grow even further so you want you know you have like a downward spiral and then you go up you know up because you're adding to your knowledge you're adding to your skills right so and and i love what george uh, bernard shaw says those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything you need to be able to change because if you're not going to change and then you're fixated and fixed in and what you have and you're not growing. But the thing is that you suffer a lot from that. So opening your heart, opening your mind and, and being open to learning really helps you to get through lots of situations and helps you also to be more adaptive to whatever gets thrown at you. And there's another one from Albert Einstein I think we're more familiar with. So resilience. In, in theory, this I love this, this uh, and I'm not going to talk too much more about resilience because I know other speakers will be talking about resilience, but I like this definition from Mary Slaughter because she was, she did a series, she did what is called a meta-analysis, so she basically researched all kinds of research that was out there in resilience for the past 30 years, 20 to 30 years. And she tried to find, because there's so many different definitions, so she tried to find commonalities, what was really common to all. And that was these things. And I actually really circled, because I don't want to confuse you with complicated words or anything, but it's really about developing skills. So new skills, because you have a new situation, so you need to develop those new skills, right? To be able to cope with the new things that are coming up. New skills that you didn't have, and, and so you get better even, right? And so that you can still perform well, and, and, and you know, maybe you're a little stressed, but as long as that's not that peak stress that, that really paralyzes you, right? And then you can't do anything. But you'll have some stress, but you'll still be able to perform. But it's always about continually learning. You're never going to stop learning. I mean, even if you think you're not learning, you are. But if you have that openness to learning, then you can learn even more. Then you can integrate the new reality into your reality today, right? And I extracted this from a webcast I did that's uh, Resilience in the Workplace, a survival guide. Uh, so yeah, it was a few tips to really how to survive the crisis. And this was post Christchurch earthquake. So that was within that context. And I think that's very similar to COVID-19 in some way for at least for some people, for many people.
Okay, now, one of the things that as newbies, newcomers, or dealing with challenges and new things, the unknown, one of the challenges is that when you are with other people, you might feel that you're empathizing a lot. I mean, I know for a fact that when I moved around a lot, I was a child and I didn't really know what to do with my emotions and 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 I was anxious and and felt isolated and you know it, it was really difficult imagine a, a small child and then even growing and and having to make new friends when everybody had their groups of friends I was like the outsider all the time like the new kid in the block and and that was you know that was very difficult so what my mother, she was a great, compassionate woman, and she taught me to be empathetic. But I didn't really know how to. So I always looked at how everyone behaved and how they felt, and I empathized with them. But one thing I didn't really know how to do is how to empathize with myself, how to take care of myself. So empathy can be too much, but that's only because you don't know how to do it right. And that's something that I want to share with you today. So how do you get it right? How do you know when empathizing is actually not doing you good? And I'm not talking about not empathizing, okay? I'm just talking about there are different kinds of empathizing. <laughs> and the one that that overwhelms us, that's that's not the one that we want. We want to develop what's called compassionate empathy. I'll get back to that later. But how do you get compassionate? How do you get empathetic in a way that you you also are protected, in a way that you don't get, you know, overburdened or you don't over empathize or burn out. And this is really important for those who work in the health industry, taking care of people all the time or teachers or pilots and, you know, people who really deal with lives, right? With real lives or with vulnerable people. So through mindful meditation, I have found that was my medicine in any case, to, to be able to cope with all these emotions that sometimes come up when things are just going, they're very, very difficult. And what it does is really help you to clear your mind. Because as Greg was saying, we have many, many thoughts throughout a day. And there are researchers that say somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 on average 50,000 or 60,000 a day. So that's a lot of thinking. How can you make a decision when you have so many things in your head? So many thoughts in your head. So by just taking that moment to be mindful of the present, just connect and then just kind of, you know, lower what you have in your head, just lower, lower your attention and bring it to your heart. Get it out of your head. Just bring your attention to your heart. And that alone already helps you to clear your mind to then be able to make better decisions, right? And uh, the byproduct, which is wonderful, is that you have better relationships. Because if you're, say, all worked up and overwhelmed and, you know, got so many things to do, so many emails, so many, um, you know, you're, you're doing more with less or you have to do more with less. I hear that a lot in, in, you know, in the workplace, in workplaces. So, of course, you can get overwhelmed. And how do you respond? Very often it's snapping, right? So if you can keep calm, what's going to happen? You're going to keep your relationships well. And so I found that mindfulness meditation was really the missing link between us being able to, you know, or, or between empathizing in the wrong way, in the way that, that really is not good for us, that makes us more overwhelmed and doesn't really help us, and to empathize in the right way, to empathize in a way that's productive for us and also for others, that's productive and that's, that just makes us feel well. Right? And if we're well and we're happy, then of course, how will everybody else be happy, uh, be around you? Probably also happier. At least you can influence positively towards their, their feelings as well. So I did lots of research into mindfulness to write in my 
book, the recent book, and I was the lead author. So I wrote it together with Dr. Wayne Duncan. And he focused on empathy and I focused on mindfulness. And, and there are different uh, theories that I looked at and people who did research and ex experiments with this and it makes you more peaceful. So there are different positives that comes from doing it properly in any case, not from trying just once and then abandoning, right? So you have to really practice. And so it, it makes you feel better, your, your whole body, mind, spirit, and because you manage to calm yourself and be in that really relaxed mode, you can concentrate better and concentrate for longer periods of time as well. So um, yeah, and, and that will increase also your resilience as well. Mm -hmm. Relationships and feeling peaceful, well, that all helps to build your resilience. So this is the little model that I built from what we were doing. And I was looking at uh, how that mindfulness, which is that connection with yourself, that, that connecting and becoming aware of who you are, what your, what your, you know, what your feelings are for something. And it's not that we're always feeling something. Very often we have like neutral feelings, you know, we're going to get a drink. Okay, let's go get a drink. You're not really feeling something, right? But I'm talking about moments of change, moments of challenges, moments of conflict, which we, we will have throughout the day or, or days, right? So that's, that's where we need to check in with ourselves, connect with ourselves. And through doing that, then we can also empathize better because we, we can be more aware of others as well and how we are impacting them. This is really important for leaders. You need to know how you are impacting others and very often you don't. So you have all these blind spots. So having that mindfulness allows you to start becoming more aware uh, because self-awareness is all good. But how do you become self-aware? Well, you need that moment of being mindful, of being completely present and attentive and to one thing only. So you focus on one thing only. And I'll talk about what you want to focus on as well. And we might have a, a chance to do a little exercise that I have for you if you feel like it. Um, but the important thing here is that it's non-judgmental. And when you empathize with people, very often the, what we commonly do is we empathize, but without really realizing that we're we're actually coming from what we experience, what we know, right? So if somebody, um, like I remember once a, a friend, um, she in, in Germany, she hurt her finger. She, her finger was caught between the door um, and the door frame, right? And, and she gave a cry and I was like, Ugh! and I could feel it. I could feel it and I could feel it so much longer than she did. She laughed, she was over it. And I, I was still like, oh, terrible, ah, because I knew the feeling. So that wasn't right. That, that was just thinking about myself, right? So that's the kind of empathizing that we normally do. We can feel what others are feeling, but we're still relating it back to ourselves. And that's not the kind of empathy because otherwise it's like, oh, I have problems. And now I have to also have other people's problems well, that's when you what you what we normally do when we empathize, right? So you need to also be able to be compassionate and take care of yourself, see what's happening, and then see the other. Okay, yep, I recognize what's happening, but with compassion, right? And without judging, without judging at all, you know. And that's what we often do when we see people people who are behaving in a way, and and we're like, oh no, I wouldn't do that right? We're creating that separation and that, that's not necessary. That, that's not empathizing in the right way because we're doing it judgmentally. No, we want to be non-judgmental. So we need to get out of our head, our thoughts, our beliefs, and just connect with our heart. Then we'll do a better job <laughs> at connecting with others in the right way. So here we have um, something that I also studied about, you know, creating that psychological safety. Uh, you, you want to, to feel safe to speak up. Uh, so leaders can do that. So if you're a leader, if you're currently also a manager or, or even a parent, right? You want kids to be able to speak up or teachers, right? You want 
your students to be able to speak up and say when something, no, they actually don't understand something, well, go ahead, ask, feel safe to ask. And that's something that you can provide when you're mindful and you also empathize the right way, not taking on their problems, but acknowledging they have it, acknowledging that's them, that's their problem, feeling for them because you know that they're not having a good moment. And that automatically creates that environment that's welcoming, that welcomes also, and you don't get defensive either, right? If somebody seems to be criticizing you, right? As a leader, you can, or a parent, you know, maybe they're criticizing you. No, they're just showing that they have a different perspective. They're showing what they think. And you need to just be open to listening. If you're able to listen as opposed to immediately, you know, giving your opinion, that's when you create that safe environment for them to then also speak up. And this is the same with leaders, right? And I, I see that when I coach leaders, that, that they sometimes feel, you know, defensive, but then when they manage to learn how to be mindfully empathic and connect with their heart, it suddenly becomes so much easier, so much easy. Uh, some, some people, um, I've, I've had one leader said once, oh, and I, it almost feels like I'm redundant now. <laughs> and before it was a struggle to lead people. So yeah, it does, because it really is, it's very friendly. So is, is there any questions? I could actually stop right here and have some questions before moving on. That's a great idea, uh, Danny. And I, I've been sitting here and absolutely loving what you've been presenting. Um, there's so much common sense within there. And we know that common sense isn't common to everybody. We, we've all got slightly yes. different ways of dealing with the world. Uh, but I, I love that you're talking around mindfulness. You're talking about empathy. Uh, and you began by talking about that element of belonging and really interesting that struck a chord with me because immigrating here to New Zealand in, when I was three years old in 1972, we lived in a small farming community and we were never accepted in that farming community as members of the community generally. We were always just outside it. These were people who'd lived here for five generations on, or more on these lands and there's a, regardless of how well we want to integrate, there is a barrier and we have to overcome that. And it has to be two-sided. It's got to come both ways. Yep. There isn't just, it doesn't work if it's only, only one way. And it does take yep. time. And I think that's one of the things that we yep. often get frustrated with is that we want to be in straight away and work it, but we don't necessarily have that opportunity. So I was re really interested that you, you mentioned that element of uh, 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 the time factor that it takes to actually uh, integrate into these communities. And, and as you say, it's so important, the host community, which in this case was the farmers, right? They, they needed to integrate you as well. It wasn't just your job, right? And, and yeah, so you integrate the better that when, when the host is also open to receiving you. And that's what I do love about New Zealand in general. But of course, you can be in communities where they're very closely knit. And those are then harder to to kind of break through. Uh, so this is really, and I think this series is not only for people who come from somewhere else originally or who have a different ethnic background, but I think it's really relevant to everyone. So also for the hosts, also for people who have been here for generations and generations. I've got to agree with you. I, it's really, uh, we certainly hope that we, our audience has spread wide and far and in multiple different communities, because that's really the only way that we will, as a nation, as a community, as a culture, as a, as a overarching culture altogether, be able to uh, really move forward and make some uh, inroads. Absolutely. So is there any question from, from someone there or yes, shall please. I just move on for no, now? We have some Q&A that's been uh, coming in right now, uh, which I'll be very happy to share with you here. So Lydia, thank you for this question here. How has living in different countries with different languages and cultures helped you to integrate or adapt to living in a new country? And on that as well, what skills did you learn that you applied when moving here to New Zealand? 
That's a very, very good question. And some of it, I think I have been sharing. Uh, now, I do know that throughout the years, each time I changed, I had like new strategies. And uh, they were very much about connecting with people who are local. That was my main thing. And it actually came from my family. They always thought the best way to integrate in a community is by trying to behave like them. Like when in Rome, uh, what was it? When in Rome, be as in Rome or something like that. I forgot now the, the full um, saying, but in any case, try to, to adopt some things. And sometimes it's about faking it a bit, right? So, and I did feel like an imposter many times, but I also needed to remind myself that it was just for the benefit of connecting with others. Because if people can't see me in a different way, then I have to present myself in a way that they can receive, right? So I remember like I was, I, I was very expressive and I still am. And now, now I'm, I'm more me, right? But in Germany, it was very common, at least back then and in my school, okay? Because it can be that, that school culture as well, right? So it's not necessarily everywhere. But there was this thing about having your hands to the side. Right, so you were standing pretty much like a soldier, and I was talking with John and so enthusiastic, and you know, <laughs> I, I I just stood out, <laughs> but not in a way that they wanted. Right, for them it was all about you know, being calm, collected, and speaking slowly, and so. Well, that's what I had to learn to do. And I really felt like a fake. It really didn't feel right. But that was until I could connect with people because then they could see me more like them. And with time, I could be more myself. Then they could see my true colors, if you wish. But for them, and that's where that empathy and that, you know, being compassionate, okay, they don't get it. They, they, they don't get it. And, and okay, I mean, how should they? Everyone was German except for this crazy Argentinian, right? Who talked like crazy using the hand, so hand gestures and moving the body and jumping and whatever, <laughs> which was great as a teacher because um, students would love me jumping around and being like a little bit of a clown. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so so that was a strategy that seemed to work quite well. <laughs> <laughs> but with time, honestly, it's really a, also about uh, taking care of yourself because that's one of the things I was always very anxious because I, I couldn't really feel that it was me. So by having that ability to now connect with myself through that mindfulness uh, meditation, or just be mindful, because for some meditation works, for some others it doesn't, but mindfulness is, it goes beyond. It's that being completely present without judging, without looking to the past or the future, just now. That helps to kind of center yourself. And so whatever happens, it doesn't really matter in the end, you know? <laughs> so I hope this helps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great answer, uh, I have to say. Uh, and that's the experiences we have, isn't it? We, we, we move into these different cultures and we have to very quickly understand. And I, I've had the great pleasure of uh, living in Germany uh, as well, in uh, South Germany, garmisch partenkirchen and uh, oh, yeah. traveled Close to where I was. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. very, and also very different experiences throughout the length and breadth of that country. So in mm -hmm. the far south, Yes. very different culture to northern german uh, and having experienced both and differences in in dialect and language and slang and everything that goes yep. with that yeah. is uh, is is pretty challenging um, and the south is like a, a different a separated country although they're all part of germany it's like uh, bayern versus poison you know bayern and then poison and it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> it's the same country, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm It's sorry. not poison anymore. <laughs> I was always fascinated by the <laughs> the differences, but you know, if I if you said the phrase I don't like it in Bayerisch, you you say Imoginet. And in German you say Ich mag es nicht. <laughs> so you, but completely different. You know, if you, if you don't wow. understand it, 
you don't understand it. That's the key, right? We yeah. don't know what we don't know. And yeah. we have to be open. And as you mentioned, you know, very, very aptly, we have to be open to be willing to learn. We must have skill and we must mm. be able to learn. So I've got another yes. couple of questions here. So I'll, I'll pass these mm -hmm. on as we go. Uh, again, Lydia, you are fantastic. Thank you for your questions. It's brilliant. Uh, here we go. How do we address people's fear of the other? whether from the perspective of the newcomer or from the mainstream culture. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it is, first of all, acknowledge that it is a real thing. It, it just, it happens. It's our common nature. So that's why before I was talking about uh, becoming familiar with another culture by reaching out to them, by, you know, being being more similar in a way so studying them it's almost like an anthropological study each time you connect with people from another culture or the other as as was or the stranger as was used before right to explain this phenomenon so just know that it it, it is real it it happens and it's all in the imagination okay this is not it's, it's not real as in real real <laughs> like i can touch this table and the table's there right it's not that kind of real uh, it feels real but it's not really so um, but we do have that tendency to, as you said, Greg, before as well, to connect with people who are more similar to us. And the other then is someone like separate from us. And, and so there were really good um, experiments that I would recommend reading uh, Henry Taggell, um, I believe that's how you pronounce it. I don't know how to pronounce him. And Turner, uh, they talk a lot about that and it's about that social identity theory. So, uh, but in practical terms, it's first of all, acknowledging that, that people have their different fantasies because they are, you know, beliefs sometimes are pretty much like, like fantasies and it's not that we're very different. So acknowledging it and having compassion for others because they, they, they don't know. They don't know what they don't know, as you said as well, Greg, right? They don't know what they don't know. And what the best thing that you can do is approach them non-judgmentally. And that is very key because we tend to judge. And another thing that I like to always share with the leaders that I coach or, or people who want to develop their personal leadership as well is that you don't need to say words for them to come across you say things through your body language, through your actions. So if you're holding some judgment, yeah, you're judgmental against people in your head, that automatically shows through. So there might be this other not accepting you, for instance, but it might also be you. So remember that example of Germany that I had to let go of the thinking I was superior or whether it's superior or not, but like what I thought was correct and what they thought or they, you know, their values weren't correct. When I could let go of that, then that's when I could reach over and finally feel that I belonged. They included me better. So they did in the end include me. Okay, so I don't know if that helps, but in a way, uh, acknowledging first and then also reaching out to the other without judgment, because we do things without doing, okay? We act out things that are in our mind. So we need to check ourselves. That's the best we can do is check ourselves and we will influence eventually. Beautiful answer. Uh, and I have one further question uh, to uh, round out the uh, Q&A session before we uh, uh, head towards the uh, finale of our piece here today. Uh, again, Lydia, you are uh, again magnificent. So the question here, how do, we, uh, how do we apply mindful empathy and psychological safety in welcoming newcomers to a country? And I think it's a really good question because it's something that we often don't think about, right? If we are the incumbent, we just kind of carry on and you guys get on with it as opposed to actually what's my part to play. So I'd love your thoughts mm -hmm. and Lydia would love your thoughts and all our audience I'm sure would love your thoughts on this. Yes. Well, the thing is when you are mindful and when you have this mindful empathy as part of the way that you act in your daily life, then you are welcoming. 
you're being totally genuine, you're being non-judgmental. So this is something, the question should be, I'll turn it around a bit. The question should be, why aren't we mindful empathy? You know, why don't we have this mindful empathy in us? So what can we do to develop? Because the thing is that it also benefits ourselves because then we're happy with ourselves. We're more authentic. We can be who we are with others, right? So if when that is developed, then you automatically are welcoming. And that's why I find that I build trust very, very quickly with people because I don't speak from here. I speak from my heart. I connect with what they are saying. And I look beyond, I don't look only at what they're saying. I look at their behavior. I look at how they're feeling, right? I look at their body language. So I connect beyond. And I think that is really key. It's that not having an intellectual conversation. If you think, see things are just not working out, if you see that people are just uncomfortable, well, I mean, in my case, I'll just say, okay, let's stop for a minute. Let's have a meditation. Let's just, you know, relax for two minutes. Let's start the conversation over, right? Now, not everyone has that expertise, I understand, but it's that trying to yourself to, you know, just get out of your head for a moment and just feel and what feels right, connect with that. And then you'll automatically know what to do to connect with others. That is absolutely brilliant. Uh, this has been a fantastic hour so far, I've got to say, of, uh, of doing some really cool stuff. Um, we are uh, pretty much on the button of time right now. I know that we started a little bit late, but um, we spoke earlier on potentially, uh, Danny, about doing a meditation here at the, at the uh, close of our piece, uh, which could be quite beneficial for um, our audience and also give uh, somebody a bit of a tool, I think, that uh, they can potentially use further down the track. So I'm, I'm in your hands as you uh, uh, feel free to take us away and uh, then I'll close us out after we uh, complete that. Okay, great. So here I'd like to first... Um, uh, share a quote and that's a quote that I wrote in a post because I like to also share my knowledge in Facebook on Facebook and LinkedIn and other places uh, we grow most if you can share that slide it's we grow most in adversity whether we like the situation at hand or not accept it patiently instead of growing, rowing against the current and learn from it. The biggest lessons come from those hard times if we can just look at them for what they really are. I want to leave you with that quote. Okay, we need to see things and look at them for what they really are because we have lots of imagination. It just goes wild. We have lots of judgments against ourselves, against others, right? We beat ourselves up when things don't go right. But instead of beating ourselves up, let's be kind and know that if we look at it from another perspective, we'll learn something. Okay. So now let's go on to a meditation exercise. Shall we do that? Yes, I think that would be uh, fantastic to do. Just a, a quick check from a time perspective. What, uh, what's our uh, time frame? Okay, you tell me how much time we have. Oh, Maybe have... five minutes? Yes, I'll sir. try to make it five. Cool. Might be a little longer. Is that all right? If I can make it bang on. Bang okay, on the five, five. five. Okay, really I'll good. have to be quick at explaining how it goes. Excellent. Okay, so first you're just going to get into a straight position, straight back, but relaxed. You're going to close your eyes, okay? So let's close our eyes. Take a deep breath, three deep breaths. And now you're going to just follow the instructions so you don't need to worry about anything. Just relax, release any tension you have. And think about how you will feel 
better at the end of this. How it will be beneficial to you and also to others. And be happy about this. Now we're going to very briefly concentrate single-pointedly on our breath as far as we can, the best of our ability. Just focus on our breath, how we breathe in and out. And try to leave all thoughts behind. Bringing your attention inward towards your breath. And as you relax into this rhythm, continue breathing as normal. As I guide you through this visualization, You're at a park and you see a family, a family enjoying their picnic on a summer day. They look different. They speak differently, probably speaking a different language. You think you will sit further away and have your picnic somewhere else. You don't know anything about them. You don't feel comfortable. But now you observe there's an aggressive goose that is attacking the child. The dad gets up and shoes it away. The mother grabs the child who's crying and tries to soothe him. You feel compassion for them. You see the dad protected the child and the mother soothed the child. You would do the same for your child. Or ne nephew or niece, you would do it for your children, your friends. So you come up to them and speak with them giving them kind words of welcome. You have realized they are not that different after all. They are indeed very similar. You have shared experiences, even though you couldn't see it before. Now keep this feeling of compassion, this feeling of understanding, this feeling of welcoming another culture, because they are very similar indeed. Keep this feeling throughout the day. When we arise from this meditation, remember this, remember 
we are all similar and we all belong. One, two, three, and open your eyes. Oh, Danny, that's an absolutely wonderful way to conclude uh, this presentation here today and uh, certainly something very tangible that uh, our audience can take away and use and reuse um, from what we've uh, heard. I love the information that you've uh, uh, given us here. Muchas gracias uh, por tu, uh, su uh, excelente presentación uh, hasta ahora. Mm -hmm. uh, just absolutely very fantastic, welcome. wonderful information that you've um, shared with us. Now, you have a book. It's called Mindful Empathy. Where can we yes. locate that book? How can we get a hold of that? that? That is on screen right now. And the best way, I would say, is just Google mindful-empathy.com. And you have a chapter to read. And you have an experience of another meditation and a little bit about the authors, and if you feel like it, the direct link to purchase it. I think it's, it's I, I like to reread it. <laughs> I'm rereading it all the time. There are tips, they're very practical, and there's lots of science behind it. A great tool for leaders, and people want to develop their personal leadership as well. So it's not about being a leader, even you taking responsibility for who you are, how you impact the world, even if it's your parents, right? <laughs> um, elderly parents or, you know, or anyone in our community, this is for you. It's, it really has something for everyone, but especially leaders, because you have the potential to grow other people into wonderful, productive, beautiful people. Danny, thank you very, very much indeed. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here on the show. And uh, I certainly look forward to our further conversations um, after this as well. But uh, just uh, rest assured that you're getting some really great feedback here um, from our audience as well to say thank you very much for the uh, wonderful um, information and webinar. Um, we will catch up with you um, in the very near future. Ladies and gents, this is uh, Danny Rios, and uh, she's been speaking to us around uh, mindful empathy wonderful stuff we will see you soon thanks danny thank you very much have a great day everyone <laughs> take care so danny rios ladies and gents and an absolutely wonderful uh, webinar here once again my apologies for the technical challenges we had right at the beginning of the uh, webinar but we've uh, given you a little bit of extra time here at the end as well just to uh, make up for that um, so this is an ongoing series. It's uh, This is uh, number three of a six-part series brought to you by the Waitakere Ethnic Board uh, with the wonderful help of Foundation North and the Aotearoa Academy. Uh, we have uh, our next speaker is coming up uh, for us next week is none other than Natalie, uh, Natalie Cutler-Welsh. Now, she is phenomenal, incredible powerhouse, I've got to say. Uh, she found, is the founder of Up Your Brave. Uh, she's a coach, she's a mentor, uh, a networking expert. In fact, she was the individual who introduced me to our first speaker in the series, uh, Shalash Bagwe. Uh, so uh, I have uh, Natalie to thank for that. Um, she's a phenomenal wellness practitioner as well. And uh, she's very much about creating community and engaging in community um, as well. So that's happening for us on Wednesday, the 25th of November. That's next week at 10 a.m. and we look forward very much to having you join us then. We would love it if you could spread the information about these webinars far and wide. We want to get as big an audience as we can. Really the, the crux here is to get as much information as we can to share with our migrant and ethnic communities in Waitakere and up to Northland and further afield throughout New Zealand and potentially offshore as well. Why not? It's really about uh, sharing our cultures uh, and giving ourselves a wonderful playing field for being able to uh, create an even more harmonious um, uh, community here 
in New Zealand. So thank you very much indeed for joining us here. My name is Greg Ward. It's been my absolute pleasure bringing you the third in our series of six in this, the Moments That Matter of Waitakere Ethnic Board series. We will see you 10 a.m. on Wednesday of next week, the 25th of November, as we bring you our next presenter, and that is Natalie Cutler-Welsh. We'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks very much indeed. Ka kite.